day after Pesach. We're right back into it. This is another testimony to our commitment. I really can't tell you. It means a lot that you keep on coming every week, even on such days when uh, people are tired, you know? It's been a long week. A lot of matzah. A lot of matzah. A lot of matzah, yeah? A lot of shul. A lot of shul. Five out of eight days. You know, like, we don't get no free time here. In Israel, they get free time. And uh, to be back, that's, that's exactly what it's all about. Today was, and even still is, the yard site of Mike's mom. Thank you for sponsoring. Thank you for coming to shul. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And uh, your mom's neshama, no doubt, experienced an elevation as it does every year on the yard site. Her name was? Antoinette Bat Arye. Neshama should have an aliyah, as we say. And very quickly, I like to say the neshama should have a yurida. It should come back down in a physical body. We should be resurrected and reunited with our loved ones. There was a great tzaddik. His name was Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev. He lived in approximately the same time as the Alter Rebbe, who wrote the Tanya, and that's what we're studying. He was a Hasidic Rebbe in his own right, known as the Defender of Israel, because he loved to find merit in Jews that nobody else could find merit. Like the famous story when he was walking on Shabbos and he saw a Jew smoking. So he said, Rabbi Yid, you probably forgot that it's Shabbos. He says, no, Rabbi, I actually know it's Shabbos and I'm smoking purposely. So he said, okay, probably you don't know that smoking is permitted on Shabbos, is, is, uh, is forbidden on Shabbos. So he says, no, Rabbi, I'm actually aware that it's Shabbos and I'm aware that this smoking is prohibited and I'm still smoking because I want to spite God. So the Radichava lifted his eyes to heaven. He says, God, look how precious your children are. They never lie. Always <laughs> <laughs> seeing the positive. <laughs> he always, he always saw the positive. He walked outside once during, uh, during davening, and there was a Jew in his talis and tefillin, because these, these coachmen, they had to get to work super early. So they would leave the shul early, and they would go grease the wheels of their wagons to get it ready. So a bunch of Jews... Local Orthodox Jews were kind of making fun of this guy, like, look at him, you know. In Talas and Tfilin, he's going to grease his wheels in the wagon. So I believe Yitzchak, at that time also, he lifted his eyes to heaven and he says, God, look how precious your children are. Even when they're greasing their wheels, they're thinking about you. <laughs> that's just, it's a different way of looking at it. He was, that, that's what he was called. So one time, he said, after either a particularly challenging meeting with a Jew who was suffering, um, or guiding somebody in, in serving God. So he also, he said publicly, he would talk to God like this many times in public, kind of just speaking to Hashem. And he would say, God, look, if you would put all the lusts and cravings and temptations of this world in a book and yourself on the streets, then if Jews didn't keep Judaism, you would have a claim against them. But you put yourself in a book and all the temptations on the street. So what do you expect from your children? <laughs> and basically, this is the, uh, the conversation that we're going to be entering now. Chapter 6 kind of marks a little turning point. We've been on a very spiritual high the last couple of weeks, learning about the godly soul, the divine soul, the purest form of existence that is. An existence that's so selfless that all it wants is just to do that which God wants. But that's not all who we are. We have a godly soul, but we also have what's called the animal soul. And that darker side of ourselves is what we're setting out to explore in the next couple of weeks. We're going to learn later in the Tanya that life in the end is an awesome battlefield upon which the cosmic and also the individual war between good and evil takes place. That's all of life. All of life for a Jew is the constant struggle between the godly soul and the animal soul. Each one wants to be in charge, and only one can win. There's no room for 50-50. The reason we have this war, Kabbalists teach us, is because that's the only way to truly serve God. True service only exists when there's free choice. If there's no free choice, we're pre-programmed robots. There's no inherent value to that which we do. 
because there's no other way about it. But once there's two voices battling for charge, now when we make the choice to have good overpower evil, now we've fought a war worth fighting. It's no coincidence that uh, we're talking about this war between good and evil. You, you can't go, these days, you can't go by without seeing what's going on on the, on the college campuses. I'm not here to weigh in politically, but we all see it. There's no secrets anymore. If we thought that uh, decades of relative calm um, indicated anything about where the world stands in relation to Israel and to the Jewish people, it's all clear. The Talmud says it. It remains true to this day. One of the reasons why Mount Sinai is called Sinai is because the word Sinai in Hebrew is related to Sinah, which means hatred. The Talmud says the day the Torah was given, a hatred came down to the Jewish people and to the world that never goes away. It's there. Not everybody has to have it. Not everybody has to have it. Many don't have it. Thank God we see today support from many in the Gentile world. But at the same time, there is a presence and it's just going to be there. There's nothing we can do about it in terms of solving it. No debates, no uh, nothing. We said it in the Seder last week. In every generation, there are those that rise up against us to annihilate us. Hashem saves us every time. We're going to be here as we were here for the last 3,000 years. But uh, the, the counterattack needs to be within ourselves to choose more good over evil. Make the voice of good heard in every way that it possibly can to become more active Jews. That's the only solution. Not less active. We don't go into hiding when these things happen. We go out into the open. We're seeing it now on the campuses. Students are going, you know, with their kippahs, with their tzitzit, with the Star of David necklaces, and it's a wonderful display. We're, we're outnumbered. That's the bottom line. Okay, we're a quarter of a percent of the population. Let's not kid ourselves. However, our presence, when it's supported with, uh, with internal conviction, real conviction in the values of our people, is what guarantees the future. And the only way to do that is education, knowledge, and activism. We have to take a more active stance in, uh, in the level to which we're Jewishly committed. Whatever you were doing until now, it requires that we do more. Whatever we were learning until now, it requires that we do more. We have to become more informed Jews. We have to because there's no other way. And our children need to become more informed Jews. And that's, uh, that's all I got on that. The war is there. Good and evil are fighting. Good and evil will fight. They always have. And what we can do, be more of the force for good. But we're focused on, that on the individual. The individual war. By the way, even, even uh, Jewishly speaking, it's the perfect time to be learning about this. We're now in the time of Sfirat HaOmer. The 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot is the 49 days of preparation to the receiving of the Torah. Kabbalistically, if, you, if you've been counting, um, every day at the end of the count, there's this, we say, what's called the Sefirah, one of the traits within our souls that we're trying to refine that day. There are seven emotive attributes in the soul. Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, Malchut. Each one is comprised of seven. Seven times seven is 49. So every day we're working on, or we're supposed to work on, one element of, uh, of our soul's makeup. So the first week, it's Chesed, all about our giving. This week, we're in the second week of the Omer, it's all about Gevura. Restraint. Restraint. How's that for, uh, for some practice? A little restraint in certain areas. Gevura could also mean extra strength. There's both. You've got to practice restraint in the right places, and you've got to also come a little bit more forcefully in other places. And that's what it's all about. We're, we're, we're supposed to refine our animal soul during this time. Our animal soul has animalistic tendencies. This is the time to focus on it and to refine it and to make it more, more wholesome. Many, um, many Jews, you know how there's a, there's a Daf Yomi program yep. where you study a page a day of Talmud? So during these 49 days of the Omer, many people have, in addition to that, accustomed to study 
a page of Talmud from the tractate called Sota. Sota has exactly 49 pages, so it matches to the count of the Omer. You study one page a day and you finish it before Shavuot. And the Sota, she, she's a woman who was a suspected adulteress. She was warned against going into seclusion with another man by her husband. She went into seclusion nevertheless, but it's unclear whether she committed adultery or not. And so what she would do is she'd go to the temple, there's a whole procedure, they would give her a mixture of water, where, where there was a little scroll with God's name that was erased into the water, it's called the bitter waters, and if she was actually guilty, one of the miracles in the temple, she would be, uh, she would be killed by those waters. But her procedure in the temple, the, 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 the offering that was brought together with the procedure was an offering of barley. Every time grain was offered in the temple, it was always wheat, not barley. For this woman, there was barley. Why? Says the Talmud, The same way her actions represented animalistic actions, so the offering that she brings is animal fodder. Wheat is considered human food. Barley is more related to animal food. So the Rebbe would say that this is the reason why we learn the tractate Sota during these 49 days, because we're working on our own animal. Our own animal needs improvement. And so uh, it's that time of the year to be focused on repairing the animal inside us. And so it's a good time to be learning about the animal soul. So the way that the Alter Rebbe begins the chapter, chapter 6, introducing the animal soul, he says the following words. He says, Ze le'umat ze asa elokim. That's the Hebrew. Hashem made everything this opposite that. It means nothing in the world is one-dimensional. Everything is two-dimensional. For every force of good, there's a countering force of evil. For every voice of positivity, there's a voice of negativity. Someone told me it's fascinating because this week, the Torah portion of the week is Acharei Mot, like you said before. And Acharei Mot, the whole beginning of it, describes the temple service on Yom Kippur. So one of the, uh, one of the parts of the temple service on Yom Kippur was where they had this raffle. There was two goats. <clears throat> and the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would draw a lot. One goat was chosen to be offered as a sacrifice in the temple, and one was sent to what's called Azazel. Azazel literally was a cliff, uh, which was thrown down, and that was part of the atonement for the Jewish people's sins. But Azazel, in a mystical teaching, comes to represent all the forces of negativity. And someone told me, literally just tonight, that Azazel, the Hebrew word, Ayin, Zayin, Aleph, Zayin, Lamed, stands for, those five words, five letters, ze le'umat ze asa elokim. These five words. That everything that Hashem made has this counter to that. In other words, the whole idea of negativity in this world is only there to offset the positivity and to allow for that battle to take place. And as it relates to the soul, because that's what we're occupied with, we're not interested so right now in the, in the cosmic or, or worldly levels of good and evil, we're talking about the personal levels of good and evil, what that means is the following. Our soul, our divine soul, has a makeup of what we called in chapter 3, the ten sefirot, the ten faculties, attributes, three intellectual powers, seven emotional powers. And the same way, in other words, everything is exactly mirrored, the same way the divine soul has that makeup of ten, the animal soul has its own full system of intellectual and emotional capacities. This is kind of uh, where the Alter Rebbe begins to develop his major thesis in the Tanya that we're not one being. His Hasidim used to struggle with the question of who am I? And we all do, a little schizophrenia inside us. You know, one day we're inspired to do good, the next, not, not, not only the next day, the next second, we feel like this lowly, uh, lustful being. So who are we? And the Alter Rebbe basically posits that we're actually two voices. There's two souls. And two souls means two fully equipped souls. It's not like one is missing and one is you know, fully mature, one is developed, one's underdeveloped. They all got the same exact system. Same way the divine soul has intellectual capacities, it thinks, it contemplates, it meditates, and it produces feelings. The animal soul is the same way. It's got all ten. With the exception, or with the difference, that like an animal, the animal soul has no objective intelligence. It only has instinctive intelligence. 
Even today, when science speaks of the intelligence that animals have, and, and there, there is a level of intelligence, we can observe it, in the way they hunt, in the way they go for food, in the way they understand their, their needs, but it's all instinctive. It's all related to self-preservation, um, self-gratification a little bit. Yeah. It all begins with the self. Only the divine soul has the power to think objectively and appreciate truths that are outside of it. And the Alter Rebbe says like this. Very interesting line that I think is worth uh, addressing. He says, the ten powers of the soul, of the divine soul, are called, in the Zohar, they're called sefirot. Sefirot means literally attributes, but in Hebrew it's related to the word sapir, which is like sapphire, or could even mean polished, shining. <coughs> the ten powers of the animal soul are not called by that name in the Zohar. In the Zohar, they're called crowns. The ten crowns of impurity. That's all he says. He doesn't explain the observation. He just makes the observation. Godly soul is called the ten shining attributes. Animal soul, the ten crowns of impurity. So in later generations, the later Rebbes of Chabad, they expounded on this. They said, why? Why is the divine soul's uh, system called with this name, and the animal soul is called with that name. So the divine soul is pretty easy. Shining, polishing, that's what it is. At its core, the godly soul is a shining piece of godliness. And its capacity is to bring that out. When we allow our godly soul to shine forth, even if there's only a glimmer or a couple of moments or a couple of incidents in life, it doesn't come out every single day, but when it does, it shines forth with a wonderful, wonderful purity and beauty. The animal soul are called crowns. The powers of the animal soul are called crowns for two reasons. There's a few, but I'm going to give you two, which I, I, I liked. One of them is the crown in, in mystical teachings uh, is seen as sort of a uh, surround sound effect, not an internal effect. Whenever the Zohar wants to give imagery of something that has an internal effect, it uses a description of, let's say, food. Food you ingest. It becomes part of you, it becomes part of who you are, it becomes your identity. Crown is something that you place upon yourself from the outside. Even the word keter in Hebrew, the word crown, could also mean surround. Sometimes in, in the Tanakh, in the, in the prophets and the writings, it means surround. Which means that the power that the, that the animal soul possesses in the end of the day never fully penetrates the Jewish psyche. There's only some kind of a surround effect that the animal soul can have upon us. It never really fully changes the way we are. That's why we say that a Jew at his core, or her core, never ever wants to be separated from godliness. When they're pushed against the wall, it'll come out. Even the protesters, you'd be surprised. The Jews who seem to be self-hating. We believe that there's a divine godly spark present in every single one of their souls that can never be extinguished. If you put to sleep, Go to sleep. No doubt about that. More on that in chapter 19. How you can put the spark to sleep. You can even fight the spark. You can deny the spark. But you can never put it out. Even George Soros? <laughs> no names. Sleep a coma. Oh, there you go. It went into a coma. You can even go into a coma. Yeah, at one point or another, every Jewish soul gets a little, yeah, a little ring. A little ring. <laughs> Sometimes we hang up. We say, God, you got the wrong number. <laughs> wrong number. <laughs> In the end, there's, there's, there's a wake up. The animal soul, as much as it can try, it can only attack us from without. There's another reason why they're called crowns. And this has to do with what's called you might have heard of it before, the worlds of Tohu and Tikkun. In the Zohar, it's described that the current universe which we inhabit is a second model of reality that Hashem envisioned. The initial version of reality that Hashem envisioned, it wasn't the physical reality, it was only a spiritual one, it was called Tohu. Tohu means chaos. And Tohu, to use the imagery of the Zohar, exploded. Or imploded is probably a better word. Yep. This version of reality saw every individual trait 
or attribute or power as functioning completely independently of every other one. Superpolar world. No balance, no harmony. If you were giving, if there was a giving force in that version of reality, it was giving all the way. Didn't care if you were homeless or rich. Background, why did you get to the place where you are? I'm always giving. It couldn't see out of the reality of giving. If there was a force for withholding, a force for severity, it was severe all the way. There was no two sides or integration. Hence the name crowns. Everybody wanted to be the king. Ana emloch, says the Zohar. Every force said, I'm king. This is the only true way. There is no other true way. Also connects to the time of the Omer counting. One of the reasons that we don't cut our hair during this time, we, we observe many practices of mourning, definitely until Lagba Omer for the Sephardim and even afterwards for the Ashkenazim. Because during this time, it was a very tragic event that happened in history. Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest teachers of Torah, lost 24,000 students to a plague. An epidemic killed 24,000 of them. And the reason given is because Talmud says, Lo nahagu kavod His students didn't behave with honor, proper honor towards each other. And Hasidus explains, come on, students of Rabbi Akiva, what, what were they bad-mouthing each other? Rabbi Akiva was the foremost. Everything, almost everything in the oral tradition we owe to him. He's the guy who said, by the way, that loving your fellow Jew is the great principle of the Torah. So how did his students fail? If he's the man who taught all his life the discipline of loving your fellow, how could his students not behave with honor towards each other? So the deeper explanation is, the Rebbe would often repeat this during this time of the Omer counting, there was no evil intentions. It was a lack of honor on account of respect for their teacher. Each person felt Let's say, after he gave a class, this was Rab, what, what Rabbi Akiva meant. So much so were they so convinced that that's what he meant, that they, there was no other way for them to see it. And if another student said, no, I heard something different, they had no room. They were so devout that they couldn't see another perspective. And that caused the ultimate loss. Because in the end of the day, a healthy Jewish person, a wholesome Jewish person needs to be able to have his convictions, but also be able to see another perspective. Not a perspective that's evil. I'm talking about another good perspective. Positive perspective. Hey, there's another meaning here, there's another meaning there. We hosted a Seder at, at my house uh, on the first night of Pesach. People from all different types of uh, backgrounds. And I was asking people to share like different family customs at the Seder and what, you, and what do you do, and it was beautiful. <coughs> Nothing is mutually exclusive. We do what we do, you do what you do, but it all comes from the same living God. The second you begin to say, it's my way or the highway, it's the second you begin to go downwards. So in the, in the animal soul, everything functions as a crown. Every force, they don't work in cohesive unity. Each one's working for their own agenda. I want to be king, I want to be king, I want to be in charge. And it's part of the reason why they can't be successful. Only when you work together can you defeat the others. The Rebbe once said this on the Shabbos after Pesach. There were some, either some soccer players in the, in the crowd or there was uh, something big in the soccer world. I'm not familiar, maybe 1980, anybody knows? 1980, there was a World Cup in 1980? Uh, so what, what was happening after Pesach in 1980? The Olympics. Some, the Olympics? There was something big in soccer, okay? Oh, soccer? Soccer. Specifically in soccer. 1980. And the Rebbe spoke. The Rebbe said you have to learn a lesson from everything in the world. Everything has to teach a Jew how to behave in the service of God, including soccer. So what's the lesson from soccer? So he said... Soccer, the game revolves around the ball. And the, the objective is to get the ball in the goal. And there's an opposing team. And only by properly passing the ball around and dribbling can you be able to outmaneuver the other team 
and get the ball in the goal. So he said, the ball is the world. The world's a ball. It's round. Hmm. The goal in Hebrew, the word, the word for goal in soccer is sha'ar. They call it a gate. So he said, the goal is the sha'ar hashamayim, the gate of heaven. We have to kick the ball into its intended goal. We have to bring the world to its intended state of perfection. We're the team. The Jewish people are the team. We're the players. We're the ones that have to give, give that ball the final kick. But there's an opposing team. The opposing team is the Yetzir Hara. Now the good news, the Rebbe said, there's no goal on the other side. <laughs> so they, 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 they can't win. It's empty net. They, can only, they can only delay. They just chase their tail. The force of evil can only delay the win. But no single Jew can win it alone. No player can win the game alone. You need the team. You need the team. The second you discount any Jew from the team, that's it. it it's, you're not going to have who to pass to in time of need. That's the signature trademark of holiness. Holiness allows for unity. Holiness allows for inclusion. Evil, fundamentally, is all about exclusion. All about asserting oneself. All about, all about not having room for the other. And that's why in the end it's hot air. In the end of the day, when you combat evil in the face, it's revealed to be nothing. The first time, or one of the first times we have record of this is Abraham Avinu. He was bringing his son to the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, the toughest test. And the Midrash says that the Satan, the prosecuting angel, wanted to challenge Abraham Avinu. And so it was a whole bunch of challenges. But one of the challenges were that it appeared as a body of water. Out of nowhere, Avram was walking with Yitzchak on the way to fulfill God's will, and a huge river comes into being. So Avram says, I gotta go. We gotta, we gotta move. Hashem has a will. So he starts walking into the river. He's walking, he's walking, he's walking. And he gets to his neck. And kind of like the story of the splitting of the sea, which we also celebrated earlier this week. He said to God, I'm just trying to do what you want. The water reaches, it's, that's it. If I keep going, I'm going to die. And he decided I'm going to take one more step with self-sacrifice. And as he took the next step, when he should have gone underwater, the river disappeared. And the lesson from that Midrash is that that's what evil is. In the end of the day, it's nothing but a hot air balloon. It has no substance. It has no real substance. When it's face down, it's revealed to be Literally nothing. But it looks like a big something. That's the challenge. God put himself in the book and the temptation's on the street. And so we have to, we have to contend with it. The fight is where, is where it happens. But, um, but that's the story of the evil. And so the animal soul has the ten full system of ten powers like the godly soul does. Except that it's, like I said before, it's, it's, it's instinctive, not so much objective. Kind of, if you think about it this way, it's actually even hinted in the words of the Tanya. The divine soul functions from the top down. Meditates first, mind first, heart second. Its feelings are guided by its mind. The animal soul is the opposite. Instinctive means it functions on the level of emotions. The emotions aren't mature. If they were mature, they'd be guided by the mind. The emotions are simply commensurate with the level of the mind's maturity. So for example, take a kid. Al Terebe gives an example himself. Take a kid. What, what kind of temptations can a 10-year-old think up? Now ask a 10-year-old, think up something, you know, what's the biggest desire that you could have? And if you could give in to all your heart's desires, what would it be? Huh? Yeah, some little, right, a little, little candy, maybe a little money if it's a little bit mature. Some yeah, too much soda. Huh? Video games. Video games, a little more toys. His mind. So the, the, these emotions or these cravings, they're not. They're for sure not coming from the mind. They're not being fed by the mind. But even the level to which they're able to assert themselves is only based on his maturity. Flip side is true also. What what gets a kid angry? The smallest, pettiest, stupidest things. You moved his Lego a little this way, that's it. The world is coming to an end. Right? We all know it. Why? 
because his emotions are functioning with this small-mindedness. He grows up. It's not, like his, it's, not, it's not like our mature minds are now feeding us mature emotions, but the lusts that we can think up are a little bit bigger than the lusts we could think of when we were 10 years old. We have a little more information. The world's a little bigger. It also takes more to get us upset, hopefully. Hopefully we've grown up in that way too. So everything kind of grows. The animal soul still remains rooted in the heart. It operates from the heart. I want what's good for me, 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 but it grows as the, as the intelligence grows. That's the only level to which the animal soul's heart is linked to its mind. Not that its mind is helping to produce the way it feels, but its mind is kind of dictating to what level it's going to feel what it's going to feel. And that's the spiel on the, uh, or the basic spiel on the animal soul. Just like the godly soul has that system, it also has the garments, remember the thought, speech, and action, which we're going to expand on more next week, God willing. The animal soul has the same thing. Each soul has a wardrobe. You can get dressed in your godly clothes, you can get dressed in your animal clothes. Every time you do something holy, study Torah, do a mitzvah, then you're putting on godly clothes. Every time you do something unholy, and I'm using that word very carefully, but I'm going to expound on it next week. The word is unholy. The word is not necessarily evil. Anything unholy is putting on the clothes of the animal soul. You're basically, th think of, think of the, uh, the makeup as the body, the thought, speech, and action as the clothes. You're allowing it to express itself in that way. You're, if you're acting on the, on the animal's emotions, the animal wants to sleep in, doesn't want to come to the morning prayers, the animal doesn't want to keep kosher, the animal doesn't want to learn Torah, the animal, whatever, whatever it is. It's fighting the, uh, the good one's agenda. So when you do it, you're getting dressed in that way. And there's many, many levels. It's interesting, you know, talking about time of the Omer or uh, refining, refining our animal soul. The Rebbe once, actually in his first, his very first Lagba Omer as a Rebbe in 1951, he talked about this. He said, people, people want to know, you know how far the animal soul can go. It's like you think about, think about the, the different emotive attributes. You know, chesed, gevura, tiferet, how they can all be expressed in lusting. So chesed would be simply a desire, a giving. A person desires negativity. Gevura, the severity, would be exercised by opposing those who oppose him. Somebody opposes his agenda, he'll hate them. You know, he'll have a... And then tiferet, the word tiferet, shares the word hit pa'arut, gloating. You could even go so far as to gloat about your lifestyle. It's one thing if you want to live you know, in, in, in defiance or against your inner core. But then to gloat about it is the next level. When I was in yeshiva, they used to tell us a story. Maybe it's, I don't know if it's fit for online, but anyway, I'll tell it to you. It's a cute story. There was a bird that was uh, a little injured and it fell into the snow. It was freezing. It was very cold. And while it's lying there in the snow, a horse came by and dropped a, a dropping. It did its duty <laughs> on the snow where the bird was. Warm it up. Warm it up. All of a sudden, the bird feels warm. <laughs> ah, and it starts to sing. La 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 la. It's happy. No, a cat is walking by. He thought he saw just a little covering, but now he hears a voice. So he finds the bird, pulls out the bird, and he eats it. So the, the mentors in yeshiva, they tell us three lessons from the story. <laughs> three lessons from the story. First of all, not everybody who drops on you is your enemy. Second, not everybody who pulls you out of the droppings is your friend. But thirdly, and most importantly, they used to say it in Yiddish, as du, as du likst in drek, was zingst du? If you're lying in, excuse my French, if you're lying in crap, what are you singing for? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> take it as you wish. What's the point? The point is sometimes we're, we don't even realize we're, we're, we're subjecting our soul to a level of soul abuse, if we can call it that, 
but we're singing about it. We're happy about it. Don't be happy about it. Some people will find every way, you know. It's like you don't even want to indulge, but you find a way to inspire the want. Like you, like you get yourself, you psych yourself up, get yourself going to it. Yeah, our animal soul can take us places that are really, really undesirable. But in the end, the point is to have the good win over the evil, which is, which is explored later in the Tanya. And so I'll close with a short thought. Yesterday was the Mashiach's day. Anybody was at a Mashiach feast? At the Mashiach feast? Oh, you were there, you were here. Exactly. The Mimuna is the Sephardic after Pesach. This is before Pesach ends, the Baal Shem Tov said we should have a feast special for Mashiach. So we were talking about uh, making everything, putting Mashiach on the agenda in every area of our lives. Like happened now, in the last couple of months, the hostages, the issue in Israel became part of the agenda. Suddenly Hanukkah became about the hostages, Purim became about the hostages, Pesach became about the hostages, and nobody had a problem. And it's a good thing. That's how it is. When something's on the forefront of your mind, it really penetrates every single thing that you do. Mashiach has to be the same way. It's not a problem to make Mashiach part of everything we do. We put on tefillin, we're thinking about Mashiach. We put on this, we're thinking about Mashiach. We're thinking about how it's all bringing the world to its intended purpose. And the Rebbe used to say, in Hebrew, Mashiach, Mem Shin Yud Chet, has the numerical value 358. There's another Hebrew word, Shliach. Shliach means agent or emissary. Shin Lamed Yud Chet has the numerical value 348. 348. Mashiach 358, Shliach 348. The discrepancy is 10. Says, the Rebbe used to quote Kabbalah on this. Shliach, every Jew is a Shliach. Every Jew was sent down to this world for a mission. That mission, to be part of the soccer team we spoke about before, to bring the world to its intended purpose, which is Mashiach. Every Jew is a Shliach to bring Mashiach. What lies in between the Shliach and Mashiach? Ten. That's the ten faculties of our soul. Animal and... Animal and godly. We've got to make sure that we're using the right set of ten. We're fulfilling our mission. When every shliach uses the ten, the ten powers of his soul to the fullest extent, then we have Mashiach. Chaim. Mm.